Anybody that uh, knows me knows that uh, one of my favorite roles in life, one of my greatest roles in life, uh, has been being a dad. Um, you know, I, 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 the first time I became a dad was about 31 years of age, and it uh, changed my life. My mic is not on. You can hear me now. <laughs> Do I have to start over? <laughs> Gee, where was I at? No. <laughs> I was 31. I was talking about Michigan, wasn't I? The maize and blue, didn't I? Wasn't I doing something? No, since I do that all the time, so no. I love being a dad. It was one of the greatest roles that was given to me that God blessed me with. You know, when I became Thad's dad, uh, it was just a great moment. I just was so excited for that. And, you know, at, you know, at that mo moment in time, it was Lisa and I, and it was, you know, two against one, so life wasn't so bad. We could handle the one, you know, and then... Megan comes along, I said, I, I, we can handle this one-on-one, -on -one. This, is, this is doable, you know, and then, of course, Emma and Luke and Jack come along, and we threw up our hands and said, we've lost it, so, you know, we just let them take over. Um, but I remember, you know, truly each one of those moments and each one of those days and, and just how I just loved, you know, being called to be that dad to my kids. Um, and I knew from that moment that life was never going to be the same. For me, it was one of my mountaintop experiences. I truly felt that God was taking me to the mountaintop and was going to show me something different that was going to change my life. My life was never, ever going to be the same. And it wasn't. I didn't know exactly where it was going or what it entailed, but I just knew that it was something that I cherished and I look forward to every day. Going to that mountaintop, my life changed. I think today we hear a story, a very beautiful story, one that all the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all record this. They record it because they know how important this moment was in the life of the apostles, the disciples, in the life of the church. He took these three up to the mountaintop. And before their eyes, they saw something that they had never seen before. Now, mind you, I mean, they had been walking with this man. They would have been, you know, his students, they were learning from him. They were hearing everything he had to say. Miracles were being shared before their eyes. But at that moment, they saw something different in Jesus. They saw not just the man, but they began to see what God had intended by becoming man and saying, look, I am God and I'm going to incarnate and become one of you. But in that transfiguration, they saw the divine. And of course, you know, it tells us that, you know, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became dazzling white. And they are standing with him on one side is Moses, on the other side, Elijah. You know, Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets at that moment, they saw the connection that everything that they had learned in the Hebrew scriptures was being fulfilled in this person of Jesus. The fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of the prophecies, the fulfillment that God is with us. I mean, it entirely changed their lives. I mean, they were so excited. You know, Peter, of course, always blurts out something and just says, you know what? Lord, it's good that we are here. It's good that we're here. I don't think he understood exactly what that meant, but he knew that there was something different, and I think all three of them knew that their lives forever would be changed. They began to understand just a little bit more. Now, mind you, they didn't understand entirely until after the resurrection, and that's why he said to them at the very end of it, he says, hey, don't say anything yet. Don't say anything until the Son of Man has been raised. Now, I always look at that story and, you know, I sometimes wonder, you know, why did he choose Peter? You know, why did he, you know, choose the three that he chose, all three of them, to go up there? Why didn't he take the, the others? 
Why weren't they important enough? Or why didn't he take a, a hundred disciples or, or whatever? Because, you know, I mean, he had all, lots of times where he was teaching lots of people. Why did he take just those three? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas puts it this way. He said he took those three for a reason because each one of them, each one of them represents a relationship with Jesus. Obviously, Peter, he loved Jesus. I mean, he said it in the Gospels. It's recorded that he said, look, Jesus, I love you. Three times he said, I love you. There's a relationship there with John. I mean, what did he say to John You know, when he was hanging on the cross? He said, look down at John, his beloved disciple, and he said, and he looked at his mother and said, this is your mother. Take care of her now. There's a relationship there. And of course, James represents that first apostle that gave his life for the cause of Christianity, gave his life for the gospel. So St. Thomas Aquinas kind of puts it this way. The point is, is that Christianity is not a philosophy. It's not just a program. It's not just ideas. But at the heart of Christianity, it's about relationships. And Jesus takes those three up to the mountaintop because he knows that that relationship is going to continue. And that is at the heart of who we are as church. In that moment of transfiguration, he changes, he changes them. And of course, it's about mission from there on out, about going to build relationships and bringing others closer to Christ. My brothers and sisters, we experience that transfiguration and that ascension to the mountaintop every time we come into this church and we come for liturgy, we come for Mass. Now you think about it. I mean, our whole experience here in Mass is all about ascending to the mountaintop. And when we get to the mountaintop, something special happens, something incredible happens. The body, the bread and the wine are changed, are transfigured into the body and blood of Jesus. I mean, from the beginning, when we process in, you know, we're ascending through song, through prayer. We're ascending because we reach and we listen to the word of God. Remember what God said, those words. He said, listen to him. This is my son. Listen to these words. And then we come and ascend to the table, our mountaintop experience, where in that moment, we see the true presence. It's more than just bread. It's more than just wine. It's Jesus that we're receiving so that our lives can be transformed. The hope is, is that when we come to this experience of the mountain, this liturgy, is that we're not just going through the, mount, the motions, we're not just checking the box, but we're being transformed. If you're really coming here with that open heart, that open mind, and you're listening to him, you transform so that you can go out and you can build relationship with him, with others. Because that's what he's calling us to do. Just like Peter, the hope is, is that, you know what, at the end of liturgy today, you're going to sit here and you're going to say, it was good that we were here. It was good that we were here. My hope and my prayer, you know, during this Lenten journey, during this Lenten season, is that whether it is prayer, whether it is almsgiving, you know, whether it is, uh, you, know, you know, doing the, the good works of the Lord and sacrifice, that you're getting closer. You're getting closer to understanding what you see and what you believe and what you receive. And it does transform you become the best version of yourself. My friends, this is really what this journey is about. Today's a mountaintop experience. We all are going to the top of the mountain, and our lives can be forever changed if you see it for really what it is. And at the end of liturgy today, when you're walking out, you just say, it is good that we were here. It is good that we were here.